Uh, as you know, Heather, you've been involved in uh, reviewing very thoroughly our patient information booklets. So these patient information booklets are produced in collaboration with patients and carers uh, for every single step of the bladder cancer journey. Uh, what are your thoughts, Heather, on these booklets? Um, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that, that these have been produced, to be honest. Um, I think it's been something that we've been needing for, for quite a long time. Um, the, the information that's already out there um, is, is limited um, and is quite hefty in, in booklets that cover a lot of things at once. It's very difficult to know when in the patient's journey to, to give them a booklet. Um, for example, if somebody's coming in with a suspected bladder cancer, you don't, you don't know what kind of bladder cancer it's going to be, so you don't know which booklet to give them. So you don't want to give them a booklet that's going to have loads of wrong information or inappropriate information. So often those patients don't get a book, any book, until they've actually been diagnosed. But actually, you know, they have those questions and those anxieties at the beginning. So with these booklets, the way they're broken down, there's, there's a book for every stage. So um, at every point, the patient can come, go away with something in written format as well to, to look at, which I think is really important, although we, we all just try and explain to the patients and, and describe what's going to happen and what the next plan is. Um, it's, it's very difficult um, for patients to take all that information in, I think. For more information about fight bladder cancer, you can visit this link or you can scan this barcode with your smartphone camera. Good morning and welcome to ePoster session 12 on bladder cancer diagnosis and treatment. My name's Alex Cahoon, I'm a bladder cancer specialist based in Cambridge and I mainly specialise in the treatment of high risk and muscle invasive bladder cancer. I'm joined today by Helena Burden who's also a bladder cancer specialist based in Bristol and she specialises in the management of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So without further ado, I think we'll get started and we'll be discussing 10 of the posters in the session. Unfortunately, two have been withdrawn. So we're going to make a start with poster one. Um, this is from Ward et al, group based in Birmingham with colleagues over in Holland. And they looked at um, the development and validation of a next generation sequencing panel for diagnosis of non-invasive bladder cancer. So I thought this was a, an interesting paper where they looked at a number of mutations within the DNA of pellets um, from urine, and they looked at panels of recognized mutations predictive of bladder cancer. Um, they then went on to identify a panel of common mutations, and they tested this within a number of urine specimens to identify the sensitivity and the specificity of their um, next generation sequencing. So, Overall, they were able to develop a, a panel which had high sensitivity, so a 98% sensitivity, but a slightly lower specificity for exclusion of, of bladder cancer at 85%. Um, I thought this was a, a very interesting paper, and I think it would be, um, it's developed a test that I think will have utility in diagnostics, but perhaps will be less useful in, in follow-up. I don't know what you think what you think about that, Helena. Yeah, I think it's interesting. So obviously they haven't completely validated it. So I think they've they've still got some more validation to do by the looks of it. And certainly over the next 12 months it, it sounds like they're going to be performing further surveillance um sort of validation. So it will, will be interesting to see. I think with all of these biomarker tests, it's interesting to see where they fit, either whether whether they're aiming mainly at the diagnostic um, side of things to try and, I guess, decrease the number of cystoscopies patients are having unnecessarily or whether it, it's part of the surveillance and po possibly um, uh, combined with cystoscopies. And I guess it's not clear yet where, where this potentially would fit in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the 98% sensitivity is, is highly attractive in terms of a, a diagnostic test, but you, you'd want to be a little bit more um, convinced with than an 85% specificity if you're in the follow-up setting but very much thought it was, was very interesting progress. And I think we, we need to watch this space moving forwards when presumably they will validate it in a much larger cohort of urine specimens. Absolutely, very interesting, I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, should we move on to the next? Um, yes. 
Um, so, so this was an abstract looking at the role of Eurode 17, an, another biomarker, um, enhancing the diagnosis of urothelial cancer. And it was our first pilot data, so smaller data than the last one. Uh, and this, the author of this was Mr. Nikhil Vazdev. It was um, a group in Stevenage um, allied with a group in America. So in, in this abstract, the group were validating Euro 17 in a prospective blinded study. Uh, the study compared histology and cystoscopy with Euro 17. Uh, they initially tried to recruit 138 patients, um, 26 were excluded and they ended up with 112 within their um, analysis. Um, so this, this um, has quite quite interesting results. They've created a sensitivity of 100% actually in, in their um, study, um, but their specificity is, is much worse than the last test we were looking at. So the overall was about 65%. And they've postulated, they looked into this a little further and postulated that this lack of specificity could be because of um, including BCG. So they were looking at surveillance patients and they thought the BCG changes might be causing some of this um, or potentially missing small recurrences. And I, I think I'm presuming they use white light cystoscopy with this. So, so their conclusion is really that they think this may fit into um, potentially uh, screening initially and diagnosis in the future. Um, but they've um, wanting to look at a, a longer follow up. So they were talking about a, a full five year follow up data. So, so I thought this was quite interesting, but did have a couple of sort of set, setbacks potentially. Um, the main ones really is that it, it's, it's quite like cytology. I don't know what you thought, Alex, there. Yeah, I mean, I think if you even if you look at the figure, you can almost see that we've got um, cyt sort of cytological atypia that we're looking at in the remote specimen where they've, they've stained it. And, it looked like there could be sort of intra-observer variability between different pathologists looking at the test. And I, I wondered if there would be any room for making it more automated. So there's obviously some staining there. Could they measure the intensity of staining to make it a more automated test so it wasn't quite so labor intensive? Um, again, I thought it was very promising that 100% sensitivity it almost sounds too good to be true. Um, I would want to know what happened to that one fifth of patients who were deemed ineligible because we, we can't tell from the poster what the ineligibility criteria was. But again, I thought very, very promising. And uh, I think it's a watch this space. This is obviously first UK pilot data. I'm sure they'll be testing more urine. In the larger series, yeah, and I think absolutely, as you mentioned, I think if they could make this a sort of point of care or benchmark testing, rather than having to involve a pathologist, then it would be incredibly promising potentially. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think watch this space is the right thing for this one, yeah. Okay. Shall we move on to poster number three? So this was from Ince et al, a group based in Leicester. Um, I, I found this a, a very interesting poster. Um, I think all of us have experience of the National Cancer Patient Experience Survey that comes around each year and it's it's grouped into different types of, of urological tumour. So this, this group basically used data linkage between different data sets. So they looked at um, HES data to identify bladder surgery patients. They looked at SACT, so the systemic chemotherapy data sets to identify people who'd had chemotherapy and also the radiotherapy data set and linked it to all of the raw data within the NCPES to identify bladder cancer patients. And then essentially it's a thematic qualitative paper looking at what is patient satisfaction. Um, I found it very interesting because I think we all think patients are worried about their cancer and the symptoms, but actually the things that, that come out from the paper are that, that things like having a long-term catheter significantly impacted your quality of life, having a stoma affected your body image. And there are a lot of interesting results in there that you might not expect. So I, I personally thought this was a very interesting paper using the data to give us information specifically on bladder cancer patients because it, it's quality of life in, in the bladder cancer arena is, is often overlooked. I agree, I and mean, particularly in the non-muscle invasive setting, there's, there's a, a real lack of data surrounding patient experience. So it's, it's excellent to see them trying to sort of pull this out uh, of, of the survey. And I think uh, it's always difficult because we don't have the authors here to, to ask them questions, but I'd be very interested uh, to, to ask them a bit about how they did pull it out. And 
the I think one of the things that struck me when I look, looked at it was the age of the patients. So they were all quite quite young um, for for our sort of bladder cancer group of patients. And I guess it, it may be that they self select in in terms of who fills in the survey. And I'm not quite sure how how the survey is given to them. Um, but it, it does seem a sort of selective, potentially a selective group. But yeah, very, very interesting yeah, results. I mean, I, I would definitely agree with that. So if you looked at the breakdown of patients, uh, the, these were patients who were having extensive treatment. Mm. So at least a quarter had oncological treatments with radio, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Um, I think a quarter had cystectomy. So they had been quite heavily treated. Um, so I think it is an enriched population of people having invasive treatment for bladder cancer. Um, and it, it's you know, they send the survey out to, to thousands of people and it is voluntary for patients to complete but it, it's quite a big cohort I think 675 patients from numbers, yeah. that year's survey so yeah absolutely really really interesting I think we um, move on to the next one um, which is again another um, big paper, <laughs> big numbers. Yeah. So, so this one is um, from Mr. Sinan Kadhuri and the Burst Group. Um, so they looked at, in, in this um, particular paper, uh, sort of uh, a, a, a small subset of results from the Identify Collaborative Study. So in this paper, they were looking at the risk factors associated with urinary tract cancer in patients referred with hematuria. Um, so they had a huge data set, so 11,000 patients um, involved in this. Uh, they split their findings into what they've called either risk factors or protective uh, risk factors. Um, and in this, they found that 17.9% uh, of patients uh, going through the hematuria pathway were diagnosed with bladder cancer. And they found the uh, risk factors for this to be visible hematuria, age, um, smoking or occupation, and they've uh, classified protective risk factors as being voiding lane tract symptoms, uh, previous hematuria or a urinary tract infection at the time of the hematuria. Uh, they also looked at um, upper urinary tract malignancy. So they found 1.17% of people were diagnosed with it coming through the hematuria clinic. And for this, they found that the risk factors were visible hematuria, age, smoking and flank pain. So I think they've concluded that they've um, confirmed some of the well-established, well-known risk factors were also identified some new ones. And interestingly, they've also come up with some what they've called or termed protective risk factors. And I think that was probably the most interesting point yeah, I, I, from this paper. <laughs> I, I would I would agree. It, you know, it's a hugely powerful number of patients, isn't it? And they've confirmed what we recognize as risk factors but you know the, the protective factors are are very interesting so we can see that voiding LUTs um, has an odds ratio of just under 0.4 but dysuria is is not a significant factor which sort of doesn't quite fit together it's I mean I think you could understand previous hematuria assuming it's negatively investigated in the past and having hematuria due to another proven cause, like a urinary tract infection, you, you could, it's rational that you, that might protect you from a diagnosis, but it, it's, it's hard to think about how voiding LUTs might be associated with protection from, from malignancy. So I thought, I thought the protective factors were by far the most interesting bit of information. Yeah, I think for, for the voiding LUTs, for me, I think the only way I could see that that would be protective would, would, would I presume that these, these people with voiding LUTs were more likely to have a larger prostate and therefore yeah. possibly it was the larger prostate causing the bleeding. And uh, I think that would be, the, in my head, the way that it might relate. But I think it's very interesting. And, and one of the things would, would be interesting to know where this group plan, plan to take this data. So I don't know whether they are planning on, you know, looking at potential, the NICE guidance, the two-week wait guidance to try and risk stratify patients further. Um, but that would certainly be something I'd be interested in asking them um, if, if they were yeah. here to ask. <laughs> and I think, you know, the, the UTI at the time of hematuria almost validates that NG12 guidance of not all visible hematuria automatically requires investigation, the need to exclude a urinary tract infection or other causes. So I think it, it adds strength to the current re referral criteria. Um, but you're right, I think, I think you would imagine that the data is going to be used probably to hone down the history taking part of your, of your hematuria clinic or your triaging system for, for referral to secondary care. Absolutely. And I guess those ones with the UTI pro probably shouldn't have actually made it to the hematuria clinic, possibly we could argue. But um, yeah, no, very interesting paper. Very interesting. 
Okay, so if we move on to paper six, so this is from Cato et al, um, um, based a number of institutions based around South Yorkshire and Yorkshire. So this is a feasibility study for the Bravo trial. So the Bravo trial was incepted to compare intravesical BCG therapy and radical cystectomy as treatment options for high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer. And this poster describes their, their initial feasibility study and they were trying to determine whether it would be possible to randomize people between two significantly different treatment modalities. So there, there's quite a lot of interesting data in, in this poster. Um, I think overall the, the results indicate that the group think it actually might be difficult to randomize people to answer this important question. And I think if we look through the paper, they screen just over 400 patients and about a third of those were approached um, to try and obtain consent. And 27%, so 51 of those agreed to be randomized between BCG and cystectomy. So having started at 407, they came out with 51 patients and had half in each arm. And it is interesting that the the majority of the patients who were recruited were all based around one institution or one region, so around, I presume, South Yorkshire. So 47 of the 50 patients originated um, from the same environment, with four out of the seven units not being able to recruit people. And I'd be very interested to know what, what the difference was in their recruitment process, because it will have been a standardised um, assessment of eligibility for recruitment so obviously something different happened between centers and that I think probably is is the bit that we need to look at if there is any mileage in, in pursuing this moving forwards um 27 percent of patients um recruited so if we think about the number of high-risk diagnoses per year you can imagine that would be quite a long randomized controlled trial to get to sufficient numbers to, to actually answer the question on, on outcomes. Um, the other interesting piece of data that, that came out was the majority of people who weren't recruited, it was because patients had a view um, about which treatment they preferred. And I, I, I often think about one of the um, outcomes from the PROTECT trial was that the um, specialist nurses were very good with equipoise at recruiting people to very different um, treatment modalities um, so that patients didn't have a preconceived preference and I wonder if there's anything we could learn from that trial to apply to, to this to this setting because I think it's a fundamentally essential question for us to answer in the high risk non muscle invasive field. I think so and I think I mean it's such an interesting paper because it is such a difficult conversation to have with patients who've got this high risk disease um, to talk to them about um, BCG versus cystectomy because yeah. they are such different treatments and most patients do have quite a clear view on what they would or would not like um, potentially based on whether they've been involved with patient groups whether they know people who've got a stoma um, and, and so I, I, I agree with you. I think looking at that small that centre that recruited most of them, it'd be very interesting to see what their conversations were like, yeah. and to do some qualitative work looking at the conversations that they had with their patients versus the conversations that the other centres potentially had with with their with their patients. Um, but it is a, it's, it's a real life scenario, it's a, which is why it's such an interesting paper. So uh, you know. Yeah, it's it's, and I think the the. the other thing that I, I took from it was the 10% upstaging in the radical cystectomy group. So on its own, that, that's important information to be able to share with patients that, you know, if, if you're choosing BCG, a number of people will be undertreated. So again, it just, just speaks to how important the question it is um, within this field. Yeah, and how important it leads to the conversation that you have with the patient when, when they're in front of you in clinic. Or... Again, again, it's a shame we haven't got the group now because I'd like to ask yeah, <laughs> uh, Professor Kata what, what the next steps are. <laughs> so. I'm sure they have some in mind. <laughs> yeah. And so I think the, we'll move on to the next paper. So um, the next paper, so this was um, a paper uh, presented um, by Mr. Atar Jafar. Um, on behalf of a multi-centre group in Yorkshire. So it's looking at the natural history of low-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, so this um, was um, a 
a group that retrospectively analysed patients over a four and a half year period who'd undergone a diagnosis of low risk uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. They used the NICE criteria to describe this. Uh, they identified uh, 390 eligible patients um, and found that overall in their results, about 29% of these patients had a recurrence, uh, which matched uh, with the EORTC tables. And then they looked at when these patients had the recurrence. Um, so this was split approximately 50-50 into patients that had a recurrence within a year and patients that had a recurrence um, over a year during their follow-up period. And their median time to recurrence was uh, 12 months and their median follow-up period was 36 months. So in, in their conclusions, I think they're really maybe questioning the uh, NICE uh, follow-up data here really in this paper. So the NICE um, follow-up obviously suggests for low-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, they are discharged at a year. Um, and in this paper, they're really querying uh, whether we should be following them uh, a bit longer. And I think it is an interesting question because the uh, NICE guidelines, the EAU guidelines and the AUA guidelines for, for low-risk follow-up are all com completely different. And I think that's partly because they come from different standpoints. So obviously NICE is about cost-effective healthcare um, and that might be why there is a big difference. The EAU and the AUA aren't, aren't based their guidelines on cost-effective healthcare. But I think it is, an, is, is, is a very interesting paper um, and I think it is um, interesting that all of these units are obviously not, not following the NICE, the NICE guidance. I know uh, there is a bit of a split as to whether units are following it or not. Um, obviously the, these, um, these groups aren't and I think it'd be interesting to look at units that are following it and really to look at their recurrence rate or to see what's actually happened to the patients in terms of readmissions or, or re-referrals maybe to compare it to this data. I mean I think I think you're right so if we looked at Hugh Mustafa did some work over the last couple of years looking at what proportion of units are following the NG2 bladder cancer guidance and it was about 50-50 uh, from the respondents who replied to the survey. So half of the units are sticking with the five years of flexible cystoscopic surveillance and half had adopted the abbreviated surveillance program. I think, I mean, it's interesting when you look at the poster because I read through the results and the conclusions that I drew were kind of opposite to what the authors have concluded. So I think we see um, a surveillance program actually that's quite safe. So 0.5% of patients succumbed to bladder cancer and only a very small proportion progressed, so 1% to 2% progression rate. And it, ultimately, NICE guidance is, you know, it's about clinical effectiveness, but it includes cost effectiveness within that. And I would want to know how many of these recurrences were symptomatic. So we can't tell from the poster. Yeah. Were these patients scoped out of sync with the standard um, follow-up regimen? What happened to patients who represented with haematuria? And you know, what proportion of patients would come back if you discharged them because they were symptomatic? And that, that's the bit of missing data, I think, that it's an unknown, unknown, what, what would happen if we hadn't used five years of follow-up? So mm -hmm. I think that would be the, the comparator for me, would be to see what are the risks if you do discharge at 12 months? Oh, hopefully a poster for next year, hopefully someone who yeah. um, is I'm following sure someone, I'm sure somebody's looking at this and, and could put in a poster for next year looking at that. It'd be very interesting to see a comparative one. Yeah. yeah. So I think next we're going, so poster eight was withdrawn. So next we're going to go to poster nine. So this is um, Nikhil Vazdev's group um, looking at, um, basically reviewing the trends in surgical approaches to radical cystectomy within the UK. And they looked at a large series of patients who'd had um, cystectomy, so 12,625, and they derived their outcome data from S data, um, which is different, I think, to the next paper we're going to discuss, which was using the BIOS cystectomy data set. So I think these two papers complement each other quite well. And it, it's really a descriptive paper about what has been the evolution of surgical technique and looking at their series of patients over the number of years that they surveyed, there was an increase in the robotic approach, which I think we probably all knew that. But the last year they assessed 2018 to 2019, 40% of cystectomies within England have been carried out using robotic surgery. 
Um, they also looked at what are the outcomes by surgical techniques, so open, laparoscopic and robotic. And it, I think probably it's interesting to compare to the next paper because their data source was HESS. We have some slightly different outcomes in terms of, certainly in terms of length of stay, although this poster describes average length of stay rather than median length of stay. But for the open series, the average length of stay was 14 days um, versus um, 11 days um, for minimally invasive length of stay, which is quite different to the data that we get from the BAUS um, cystectomy data set. Complication rates between technique were similar, um, although the nature of the complications did differ. So patients having open surgery were much more likely to have infective type complications, although the overall rate of Clavian Dindo 3 and above was similar between technique and the mortality rates were similar, thankfully, I think because it's a rare event um, in post cystectomy. So the other bit of information in it that was interesting is it was cost neutral between robotic and open. And I think lots of units have found the reduction in length of stay is essentially what makes it cost neutral to do minimally invasive surgery. Yeah, no, I think I think the interest. Yeah, I thought I thought it was interesting that all, all of the lengths of stay were reducing. In uh, obviously there is a difference between the open and the robotic, but actually if you look at the trends over time, all, all of them do seem to be reducing. And I wonder if that's the enhanced recovery pathways that are getting better and better as well. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, yes, it's, it's interesting. And obviously in a, in a minute, we will compare it with the with the second paper, which is so yeah, the surgeon reported data set, which is slightly different to this one. But yeah, no, very interesting. Yeah. So the, um, the next paper, which we've um, obviously mentioned already, uh, is a, an abstract by Joseph John uh, on behalf of the bowel section of oncology. Uh, so this is looking at benchmarking radical cystectomy, analysing uh, the BAUS data set for radical cystectomy. Um, so this uh, reported two years of BAUS data between 2006 to 2018. Um, and this uh, is obviously a surgeon reported database. Uh, so what they have done is looked at this compared to the HES data to see uh, the completeness of their data. And they found a 93% analogy. So it's, it's pretty uh, complete data set. Uh, they then went on to look at a number of different fields. Um, so they looked at how complete the data sets were in general. Uh, so how good the surgeons were inputting. And in general, actually pre pretty good. So most of them were over 80% complete for most fields. Uh, certainly the initial operation around the um, perioperative period was better inputted. And some of the follow-up fields were less, uh, less complete. Um, and then they reported a number of fields, including length of stay, uh, surgical modality, readmissions, lymph node yield, and upstaging and downstaging. Um, and their aim really from, from this paper was to provide a comparative benchmark for, for UK surgeons, uh, which I think that they have done very well. Um, so I think, yeah, in terms of the discussion points or the interesting points raised from this paper, and again, particularly, um, as we said, comparing to the last paper, so the median length of stay on this paper was seven days for the robotic versus 10 days for the open. So we've got a, a discrepancy between that and the HES data, um, it's sort of three or four days. Um, interestingly, again, we talked about upstaging in one of the previous papers, they found 20%, 27% were upstaged, that is an overall upstaging and they've, they've broken it down again, but I think, I think that's also quite an interesting finding. Um, and again, they've looked at uh, what percentage were open, what percentage were lap and what percentage were, um, were robotic and again, it probably mirrors pretty much what, what we saw from the HES data there. Um, but yeah, no, I thought it was, thought it was in, you know, a large, big, interesting benchmarking data set really. Yeah, and I think it, it's it's I mean it, it's something that the cystectomists of of England have have done well, um, putting in a very complete data set, and I think this gives a a fairly accurate reflection of what the outcomes, surgical outcomes are for for major surgery. Um, I think it is interesting that the difference between the HES data um, derived paper and this accepting it is surgeon inputted but it is um, linked to HESS to derive the accuracy of the numbers of cases that are put in and it, it's actually pretty well matched. 
um, that we know that the NSIP programme that's going to be used to um, allow single surgeon outcome assessment moving forwards is actually based on HES data. Mm. And I think the, the message probably is um, people need to be in their units discussing with their codings team HES data because it has to be, you know, the inpatient stay needs to be attributed to the correct surgeon with the correct procedure code to produce valid data that I think will be useful for us to, to continue to compare ourselves to these benchmarks that have been derived by, by this group. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the same for pretty much all operations, isn't it? Is yeah, it is. And it, a, it's a relationship with your coding not, not department. Just to, me. Yeah. To get your figures right. Yeah, absolutely. So move on to the next one. Right. So poster 11. So this was by, just move on to the next one. So this is by Ketrapal um, et al. And they're um, a group predominantly based um, in the south, so quite a few centres. And they were looking at whether you could use wearable devices, particularly looking at step count, and to see how your step count mapped to your CPET um, results and whether either of those parameters could be used to predict complication rates following radical cystectomy. So this is embedded and as part of the IROC trial. So they were looking at ways to try and assess preoperative fitness and seeing if, if something as simple as, as wearing a, a step counter could help to predict um, whether you might need level two care postoperatively, what your complication rate might be. So they um, assessed 57 patients, and, and it's interesting, the average step count, I felt humbled, was 8,800 per day. I think I need to walk a bit more when I'm at work. Um, so patients were reasonably active within, within this cohort. And they found that the step count mapped quite well with the anaerobic threshold, so the outcome from CPET testing, but that to predict, um, Clavian Dindo three and above complications, you needed a combination of the step count and the CPET outcomes for it to be predictive. Um, so I think I think they probably need some more numbers um, in their trial to assess this. And I know they're planning on looking at a much larger cohort. So the the IROC cohort is over 300 patients. So I think they probably need to have um, some more patients to assess and, and to see whether there is any stronger correlation because on its own step count didn't predict um, complication rate um, and neither did CPET testing but it was you had to have a combination of the two so um, I think this is probably work in progress and probably needs to be revisited when they've recruited some more patients. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought the same, really. It was very interesting, um, but small, small numbers, really, at the moment. Um, and I just wonder if they, it might be easier for them to take this out of IROC, because I think IROC does have its, its own issues in terms of recruitment. Um, again, it's the sort of the equipoise between the, the two approaches. Um, and it may be that if they took this out of IROC to the general cystectomy population, they, they'd get much uh, higher numbers. Um, which might make it easier for them to then compare. Um, but yeah, no, um, very interesting. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everyone is so reliant on step counters these days. Of, um, I, th I think patients would find that uh, uh, probably quite an easy one. Yeah, to, yeah. a great way to mm -hmm. engage patients in their own um, perioperative pathway, investing in, in their own outcomes. And, and virtually everybody has a step counter of some form nowadays, so a cheap intervention i would say i think shows great promise moving forwards yeah absolutely Brilliant. okay and then i think we've got the last abstract um so this uh was um again another very interesting paper i thought this one so it was looking at um, robotic assisted radical cystectomy in the over 80s so this was a multi-center study from seven uh, uk centers uh, and this paper's um been submitted by uh, mark yo on behalf of the group. So they've uh, collected data over nine years um, in patients um, aged over 80 who'd undergone a cystectomy and then compared their outcomes to randomly um, selected patients who were under 80. 
uh, they've assessed a number of variables um, and uh, their results really found um, some differences between the over 80s compared to the under 80 population. So they looked at uh, the complication rate. So in particular, Clavian Dindo 3 and above, they sat, found that it was 12.5% in the under 80s and 17.7% in the over 80s. Uh, they found the length of stay was different in the over 80s, so it was higher at 11.8 days versus 8 days in this, in this paper, um, but no overall difference in, in survival. So their conclusion really was that you could find uh, or get achieve favourable outcomes um, in the over 80s um, undergoing radical cystectomy, but probably careful selection was needed. Um, and I, I think this is a really good paper because it, it, it just teaches us not to be ageist, I think, really. So an 80-year-old versus a 70-year-old can be very biologically similar or um, even preferable. So the 80-year-old who cycles to clinic, for example, to see you is quite different from the 80-year-old who gets wheeled in in a wheelchair. And I think it just really um, shows us that not all, not you know, not the age can't be a discriminator, really. Um, but it can be safely performed in, in patients, uh, in selected patients. That very much so. I mean, and I think it, it's age is always just a number. This is all about physiological fitness for, for surgery of this type. And there are lots, you know, we've, we've just talked about wearable devices and step counts as a proxy measure for, for what your fitness is. Um, at Cambridge, we do six minute walk tests and determine how far a patient can walk briskly for six minutes. Um, there are various measures of, of fitness I mean, on the face of it, the, the poster, it, it almost, when you read the conclusion, it sounds obvious. Patients over 80 have a one and a half times um, increased complication rate and a longer length of stay. But actually what I think it tells us is it is safe in a selected population to offer this surgery. I'd be interested to know, I mean, it's a slightly different question, um, has the ability to offer robotic surgery lowered the threshold of, of the patient's receiving cystectomy if it was compared to open cystectomy in the over 80 year olds where you really do have to be fit but lots of tertiary cystectomy units will have a number of patients in the over 80 group that they have successfully operated on so I think it will be interesting to see whether the age at which you have um, your cystectomy robotically is is changing in, in the UK perhaps something for the, the HES data and the mouse cystectomy set to look at. Because they had a number of 80 year olds within their subsets. So yeah, they, they do. So. Something they could pick out there to look at. Um, but I think, yeah, no, a very, very interesting paper and, and very useful for our fit, fit 80 year old patients. So to say that they can, can pull through this, but might just have a bit of a rocky time around the operation. Um, so I think we've come to the end of our um, abstract. So just we would just want to thank everyone who's submitted an abstract and a poster. Um, thank my co-host um, Alex um, and enjoy the rest of the meeting.